see, share them, tweet at me, email. Um, happy to discuss this. So, uh, about me uh, in a past life or in several past lives, I was kind of a DevOps-ish, Perlish guy. I often describe myself as the Perl guy on the Java team. Uh, prior to, uh, after that, I was what I would call a JavaScript ruiner. That's not uh, imposter syndrome. That's just the reality of how good I was at JavaScript at the time. Uh, from there, uh, became kind of an agile facilitator, uh, helping a company during their uh, agile transformation. Uh, and then took a job as what I would say is an open source enabler. So I was working in a large open source program office, uh, helping developers uh, by streamlining the process to open up their ability to con uh, contribute to projects, be involved in projects, release projects of their own, um, which takes me to the now uh, head of open source at Indeed.com. It's the job site, uh, the biggest job site in the world. Uh, and in a future life, I see myself as some kind of combination between rock star, vampire, wizard, and robot. Uh, but obviously, I'm still figuring that out. Um, so I want to I want to also tell a, a bit of a story, uh, and this goes back to uh, the landscape when I joined Indeed in 2017. So I joined the company uh, in very late November, uh, and at that point, budget for running the program office had already been allocated, assigned, uh, and just sort of penciled in. They had a rough idea for what they thought it would look like, um, and uh, there were some sponsorships that they had already on the radar: uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, the Apache Software Foundation, Python Software Foundation, uh, the Open Source Initiative, and then money for a, a large uh, conference sponsorship, uh, and then some money to give to Webpac. Uh, I was able to find room in the budget to give some money also to Outreachy. I uh, want to encourage everybody to do that. It's a fantastic program that we should all be supporting. Um, but the thing I really want to call attention to on, on the picture here is Webpac, because if you look at everything else, there are foundations that are supporting entire ecosystems uh, or you know, the open source initiative who guards the definition of what it means for a project to be open source in a significant conference. And then this one software package um, that isn't clear, clearly isn't used everywhere in the stack. It's uh, you know, used in, in some places. And so I, I asked about uh, how, how we landed on this group of sponsorships. Um, and as I understand it, the story went something like this. Uh, there was someone senior in the company who said, we should be giving money to Webpack because we use it. Uh, and my boss, Jack Humphrey, said, I think this is a fantastic idea. Awesome. And then it just happened. Right? Um, and that's not usually uh, how at least it is supposed to work. Um, how it supposedly works is a program head defines a budget, um, and then they select some sponsorships that are strategic in nature, things that will help them move messaging forward or, or things that they think need to be supported. Um, and then, you know, every quarter or so you sign and ex execute those sponsorships. And this might be how you think it's going to work, um, and you might hope that it's going to get you to world peace, um, but it doesn't quite. How it actually works is uh, the program head asks for some budget, and then they get back an adjusted budget that's usually been trimmed in some way or another. Uh, and then, you know, you earmark where you think the sponsorships are going to go. Beginning of the year starts, it's January 1, and if you're me, it's January 2, and you start getting all these new ideas of things that you didn't think about when you were doing the original budget, and you're now reprioritizing. Are, you know, are these the right sponsorships that I want to do? Um, where do these new ideas fit into things? Uh, and then there are senior folks who come in and they make recommendations about other projects that they think that you should be supporting. You know, we should show up at this conference, or we should be sponsoring this community, or we should be giving money to, to this project. Um, and then there are some high-level discussions, uh, in this case between me and my boss and, and some other senior folks, and then we have some reasonable disagreements about um, how we think we should distribute the money. Uh, and in the end, we, we land to compromise, half happy, right? Some of us get what we want, some of us are sad because they think we're doing the wrong things, and some people get kind of a mixed bag. Um, that's, that's all fine, that's sort of the way you work through these kinds of problems, um, but uh, these high-level discussions are exclusive in nature, right? So. If these are the people who are having the discussion, this is not what our company looks like, right? Uh, you know, b below us, there are several people who manage teams. Those teams have team leads. Those team leads have developers and designers and people all throughout the company um, who are doing a lot of work that aren't involved in these discussions, right? So the discussions are being held by a very small group of people, um, and those discussions are seldom transparent. Unless you're in the habit of publishing transparency notes uh, on the kind of meetings that you're having, um, someone who's further down in the organization might understand we give money to the software, uh, Python Software Foundation, 
but they might ha not have any idea on how you got to that decision, right? So uh, the discussions are, are seldom transparent. Um, and then teams and individuals who have ideas or, or have opinions about where you should be sending sponsorship dollars have to escalate requests. Um, and that's you know, easy if you're high up uh, in the organization. And if you're further down in the organization, depending on what your organization is like, it might be a game of telephone or you know, hundreds of games of telephone that are competing for information. Um, so when we looked at this, uh, we decided we wanted to try something new. Uh, and so we've created something we call the FOSS Contributor Fund. Uh, and the FOSS Contributor Fund is an initiative that we're running over the course of the year to attempt to democratize this aspect of the sponsorship progress. And I want to talk about uh, how we put it together, what we think it's going to do, what we've learned about running it so far, uh, and uh, what the intentions are. So uh, the FOSS Contributor Fund is a dedicated budget um, that we asked for for the year that is separate from anything at the organizational level or anything at the conference level. So uh, these are just sponsorship dollars that we've put in a bucket that will be distributed to projects that we use. Um, the projects uh, to receive funds, they have to be nominated by employees. So anyone in the company has the capability to say, this project is important to my work, uh, and we should be making sure that we're, we're helping sponsor and, and sustain them. Um, they, the projects do have to meet a set of selection criteria, and I'll go over those uh, here in a moment. Um, and then contributors at any given month uh, vote on the allocation of the funds. So anyone who makes an open source contribution uh, or a contribution to a free software project uh, over the course of January will get to vote on where the funds for January are distributed. Um, and they're distributing on $10,000. So it's $10,000 a month uh, over the course of 2019 um, uh, that will go to free and open source software projects. Um, so as far as the project selection criteria go, uh, it has to be, uh, the project has to use an OSI approved license. Uh, the project has to be something that we use at Indeed. Now that doesn't mean that it's somewhere in our stack. Uh, it could be the imaging software that the IT group uses uh, to uh, get new machines ready for new employees, right? So we have to use it somewhere. Um, uh, they have to have some way to receive funds. Not all projects can or want to receive money. And so there has to be some way for our procurement department to pay them. Uh, anybody here work with procurement departments and corporations? Uh, maybe two dozen hands? Um, it's pretty easy for me to, to give somebody 100 bucks. A lot harder for me to give someone $1,000. Gets weirdly easier for me to do it if it's $10,000 because there's a process for it, right? Um, so if we're going to make donations of this size to software projects, they have to have some mechanism in place. And that can be a PayPal button as far as we're concerned, um, but an open collective or something similar. Um, and then the project can't be owned by an employee. You can't self-nominate your project that you're moonlighting on to receive $10,000. Right? Um, so what we're hoping to accomplish with the initiative is several things. Um, the key thing, and I really want to talk about this for a second after I, I get a, a quick drink, um, is that we want to drive open source participation within Indeed. Um, so let, let's talk for a moment about what it means to sustain an open source project. Money doesn't solve the problem. The sustainability conversation has been going on for several years now, uh, and it's widely understood that the way that you sustain software is you get involved in sustaining the software, right? Um, money is an easier lever to, to flip uh, within a corporate context than time um, sometimes. Uh, not, not all companies are equal. Um, so one of the goals of the initiative is we really want to get people more involved. That's why um, the contributors over a given month are the ones who have the, the voice in voting on where the funds are distributed. We want to recognize um, their work there and then run parallel initiatives to get them more involved, highlight projects that should uh, be receiving contributions from us, um, and uh, make sure that uh, people understand sort of the, what the process is and what the, what the inroads are. Um, the next thing is we want to highlight projects that are important to everyone uh, in the company. And I'm looking around the room here um, for one of the people I know that also runs an open source program office. Who runs an open source program office in the room or is involved in it? Wow, far, oh, far more of you than I, than I would expect. Um, keep your hand up if you know 100% of all the open source projects in your company. All right, one, two people, right? 
Um, it, it, if I look at something like a white source report or uh, a code analysis tool that kind of looks at our stack to tell us what there are, we have thousands of projects and modules that are used uh, everywhere. And I expect that's the same for most of the rest of you uh, in anything but a small company. Um, and so if you quiz me in the hallway, I could probably you know, give five or six things pretty easily. And the longer I ramble, I'll get to 10 or 20. I'm not going to name a 1,000 things. But there are people in the company who use these packages and use this software every day. It is critical to the work that they do. Um, and it's not visible to us that it's important to them. And this is a way for them to highlight projects that are important and to hopefully discover things that, that maybe aren't getting the uh, kind of support that we should be giving them. Um, obviously, we want to help support and sustain the, the software that we are dependent on. Um, but we also are tr wanting to try something new in the sustainability space. Again, the conversation has been going on for more than a few years, um, uh, and it really ticked up over the last few years about how to keep these projects uh, sustainable. Uh, and so there are a lot of different people trying a lot of different things to approach the problem. Um, this feels like a new one, and we, uh, we want to run an experiment with it. So um, all sounds good. What could possibly go wrong? Several things. Um, I touched on this briefly, but money might be wrong for the project. Um, some projects explicitly don't want to receive money. Um, some projects um, you know, have decided that uh, the amount of money that they would need to receive to make a difference for the project is so significant that it's not worth the overhead to try to, to gain it. Uh, and they take a different philosophical approach. So some projects just don't want the money. Um, some projects, uh, if you show up with a drive-by sizable contribution, it actually can create problems for them. Um, I think it was Deb earlier that was talking about uh, conservancy helping with projects who get money and aren't sure what to do with it, right? Um, so money might be the wrong answer, and again, money won't solve the problems. Uh, work solves the problems. Um, our voting process might unintentionally select a project that is problematic in some way. It might have a toxic leader. It might have a toxic culture. Um, there might be some other uh, problem with the project uh, that we have to like, take a, a step back and see if this is the right thing for us to be doing um, uh, as a company. Um, our process might break down in so many ways. Right? We might um, get uh, to a point that we realize we're not actually meeting any of the goals. We're not driving participation. The money isn't making a difference. Um, we've laid out how we think this is going to work for us, but it might not go the direction that we think it's going to. Um, we might ultimately need to curate nominations. Um, you know, again, thousands of modules, thousands of projects in use all across the company. Um, if someone goes through and nominates all of them, um, you can't run a SIVS poll for 2,000 projects, right? You can, you know, even when you're trying to do 10 or 12, you're kind of pushing the, the boundaries of what people can, can wrap their heads around. And so we might at some point need to police and curate nominations uh, in a way that's transparent for everyone. Um, so there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. Um, as we've talked about the project internally, um, we've set the expectation that we're going to learn as we go, and we're going to share our learnings as we go, and we're going to commit to sharing our learnings both inside and outside the company as we run the fund, because we'd like to see other people trying new things um, in the sponsorship space. Um, and we think this is a neat idea uh, to get people more directly involved. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we got executive buy-in for this, um, because uh, it, it felt like a very tall ask at the time. And I really uh, would like to be able to say, like, here is a fantastic strategy that I used to implement to, to get this sold. But the, the reality is it went something like this. Uh, uh, too long, don't read. Can I have $120,000 for a sustainability fund for next year? And Jack said, that's, I think that's a fantastic idea. And um, that sounded familiar. It's more or less how Webpack went, um, I think, anyway. Uh, this is more a testament to, to Jack than it is to anything else. The reality is um, I, I had written a one-page um, one pager uh, so that it would be easier for him to consume. Uh, and the first paragraph underneath the TLDR was, I'm asking for a budget of $120,000 allocated in 2019 for distribution to free and open source projects which Indeed consumes. Each month, Indeed would distribute $10,000 to a project voted on by Indeedians who made an open source contribution that month. This would democratize where some of Indeed's open source dollars go while giving open source participants motivation uh, to, uh, to self-identify and engage with the program. Uh, and then there were 
you know, a little bit of breakdown of how I th thought it would work and how it, what I thought the goals would, would go, uh, uh, look like. Um, and I kind of fired and forgot, right? Uh, you know, like I've written this thing up, I've got it out of my brain, I'll hand it off. It felt like a long shot. It was very early in the year, actually, when I sent it. Um, so when he responded within, you know, an hour, this is an actual code. I think this is a fantastic idea. It's the first thing that he uh, said. Um, I, was, I was definitely caught a little flat-footed. Um, and I can't tell you personally how many times I rewrote that number. Um, you know, can I have $5,000? Can I have uh, $1,000? Can I have $120,000? Right? Boss might watch this. Don't who's, give that away. who's boss? Your boss might watch this. Don't give that away. Oh, that's fine. No, it's fine. Uh, he knows. I don't really hide anything. Sorry. I was, told, I was told not to give that away, and I was shushed by someone from the front. Um, anyway, don't, tell you, don't let your boss know. No, absolutely. I, I rewrote this number several times. Um, but in the end, I decided to ask for $120,000 for it, um, and he thought it was a fantastic idea. The, go the lesson here is always ask, right? If I had asked for $60,000, he would have said, I think that's a fantastic idea, right? Um, well, I hope so. Um, uh, and and I, I, I kind of broke myself of the habit of not always asking um, through charity fundraising that I had done over the years. You do enough of it. Um, you realize that you, you ask people, because if you don't ask them, they never have a chance to say yes. Right? And I'm going to come back to always ask a few times here. So um, it's very early days, but I want to talk about what we've learned so far. So it is uh, February something. I don't know. <laughs> I've been on the road a little bit. Um, uh, it is February something now. So January just ended. What have we learned so far? Uh, for January contributions, I can definitively say they went up. Um, I hope Brian's not in the room because he's going to want to have lots of questions about uh, this one in particular. Um, uh, this is just counts of contributions, October, November, December, January. Uh, November, uh, fairly slow for us. We weren't running any programs and big holiday gap in the U.S. in the middle of it. Um, and there are a lot of factors that could be going into why contributions in January were higher. But I know they were. Whether or not it was all tied to the program, that remains to be seen. Um, nominated projects, we had about 20 projects that were nominated. And uh, 10 of them uh, I, are, are projects that I would probably name if you said, hey, what do you use at Indeed? Five of them, I knew about them, uh, but I didn't know we were using them. Uh, and there were five projects I've never heard of, right? Five software projects that are free and open source that are in use at Indeed. Um, that probably show up in a report somewhere um, that are competing for attention with thousands of other things on the same report, but they were important enough to someone else in the company uh, who was involved in, in contributing to open source that they nominated them and said, we think they should be receiving $10,000. And that's super fascinating to me, right? Um, this is one of the results that I was, I was really hoping that we would see. Um, so uh, excited about that. Uh, as far as participation, what has it done for open source participation? I'm not going to make a call on that yet. It's very, uh, very early days, very young chick here <laughs> that we're growing in the program. Uh, so participation is, is, is TBD, but as we learn more about it over the year, like I said, uh, we will continue to share. Um, now, uh, if you're interested in trying something like this yourself and democratizing this part of the sponsorship process and putting some of that power into uh, the hands of uh, other people in your company, um, there's some things that you can do. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, this is basically an email <laughs> alias to me and two other people in the company, so it's not a, you're not signing up for lists, you're not signing up for leads. This is literally send us an email and say, I want to hear how this goes. Uh, or uh, we want you to come uh, uh, help sell a similar idea internally, reach out, um, and we'll let you know how it's going. As far as um, the program itself, uh, after we get a little bit more information uh, about how it's turning out for us, um, we will have what we need to release uh, documentation about everything in the program under a CC uh, license document, probably end of the quarter or so. so. Uh, I'm expecting by the end of March, uh, beginning of April, we'll push out better documentation about what we learned, uh, how it's put together, um, and give the ability for anybody to copy and modify that. Um, if you are working in a company and using free and open source software, speak up. Advocate for the projects that you're using. Always ask, right? Uh, because if you don't ask, uh, you, don't, you don't know uh, what kind of support that you'll get. Um, if you are someone who uh, is involved in making decisions about how sponsorship dollars are spent in your company, always 
ask, right? Ask everyone in the company. Go to the IT desk and ask them what, what is important to them. What do they need to do their job? Um, ask people uh, in design. Ask people in research. Ask people in all parts of the organization um, what is important to them, and you will learn things. You will find things out about uh, uh, the software that's being used. Um, we're past the point where uh, if you work for a large company, uh, uh, your budget is almost certainly set by now, uh, and you probably have some room to play in there, but not room for a significant uh, initiative or a significant new one. Um, but if you do want to get started earlier, um, uh, the Open Collective uh, launched something, I think for the first time in December, where you can purchase di digital gift cards that can be used to provide funds uh, for op uh, free and open source software, pro actually any project that has an open collective behind it. Um, and so this is a great way to recognize open source participants in your own company, um, you know, giving them the ability to say, here, here is some uh, cashy money that you can give to a project on Open Collective. Um, super interesting and super cool idea. Uh, I'm getting uh, the 10-minute sign there, which is exactly perfect because I wanted to leave about 10 minutes of play at the end for questions. I'm good for questions. Thank you, Go Dwayne. Uh, is that what that does? One and then two, and we'll keep going from there. You uh, sort of answered my question, I think, a little bit, but um, I, the idea of having the employee uh, being contributors, the, the people who are voting and nominating products is great. Right. Um, one of the questions I had was, how well did that work with uh, other organizations besides developers and their kind? They're, they're contributing to open source projects for those sorts of needs, which are often more uh, need more attention. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, if I I'm sort of mentally scrolling through like what's our um, what's sort of the cross section of uh, of our contributors right now and our active participants. Um, most of them are developers because the pathways for developers are fairly well worn. Um, the documentation that we push internally and um, you know, the events that we hold internally, we consistently try to send the message that this is not a developer thing. You can be a designer, you can um, be a, a pure uh, QA test engineer, um, you can come from a wide range of disciplines and come in and make contributions. Um, we're, holding, um, we're holding an event uh, in um, Q1 uh, around getting people onboarded for their first contribution. So people who've never made a contribution who want to make a contribution. We keep trying to cast a wide net, uh, and if I was to be honest, I don't know that we're, we've successfully learned how to engage design in these same conversations um, and other parts of the organization. So um, we keep trying things and iterating on them and running experiments, and we're hoping to grow participation kind of at all levels. So thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about the nomination process? Uh, the question was, can you tell us a little bit more about the nomination process? So um, the, uh, I, I alluded in one of the slides that uh, we wanted people, uh, sorry, it was when I was first writing up the, uh, the document uh, and said that it gave people the opportunity to self-identify and engage with the program. Um, the, the kind of bumpers that we've put around that, and I guess I, at first I should clarify, we don't have a workflow in the company that forces you to come through and disclose all of your open source work, right? Um, we have policies, um, but you don't have to like turn over your GitHub ID when you turn up or turn over your other IDs. Um, we want people to come and self-report this information, um, and then we want to get them engaged with the program. Um, we take nominations from people who've done that, right? So. Um, uh, we promote it through blog posts, through, uh, we have a, an internal network of monitors that we can post slides to, we promote it through that. So we invite people to nominate projects that they're looking for, and when they go to the nomination process, they say, tell us who you are, right? And after that, then they can nominate something. Um, someone else in the program then goes back and vets those nominations and makes sure they have an OSI-approved license, um, that we understand where we're using it, and kind of checks to make sure that it meets all the criteria. Um, so that's a, a little more about the nomination process. Uh, so you yes, know the story about how your boss was very willing to, you know, the, I guess, approve this program that right. you're building. Uh, can you kind of double click a little bit on that for the rest of us whose boss is not that understanding? <laughs> right? like, what, what part of the pitch you, like, you, know, you think would uh, align well with their sense of concern, et cetera? 
Um, fantastic question. Uh, to summarize it, um, my boss was super easy to convince and not everyone else's is. I'm super lucky, <laughs> right? Um, uh, I have worked in programs that were resource starved and it's really hard to get anything done. Um, and in any given company, you know, that, that same bucket of $120,000 is competing with many, many other things. Um, so convincing someone that this is where you should be spending the money can sometimes be an uphill fight. Here's what I'm hoping will happen. Um, I'm hoping that we will run the experiment and we will learn enough that we can share the upside of it that then we can give people that ammunition to take back uh, to have those conversations, right? Um, again, early days yet, still working our way through it, but um, uh, uh, work for an awesome boss <laughs> is the best advice I can give right now. You've done a lot of outreach internally to educate your employees about what's going on with your idea here. Mm -hmm. What about the projects that actually win? Are you going to send them a link to your Faustin video so that they know <laughs> what you're trying to do? So, um, and an extra credit follow-up, will you get feedback from them on what they think about it? It's, it's actually a fantastic point, um, and, and thank you, Tom, for raising that. Like, what, what about the projects? And so one of the, one of the things that could go wrong in you know, the process coming apart is we could show up to a, a project and say, we've decided to give you $10,000, and they might say, no, nah, we're good, right? And we haven't built in anything to the process that says how do we like, re-nominate or what do we do there. Um, uh, we want to make sure that we're pointing them to resources so that they've got the help with the funds um, if they need them, right? So, and that's kind of the first thing that I think about. Um, for projects like uh, uh, Webpack and uh, uh, Babel, right, uh, that uh, are kind of used to this fundraising model. They already know what to do with it. Um, but for a project that doesn't know what to do with it, we want to point them to Conservancy to make sure that they're getting some support there. Um, and uh, we want to stay engaged with them to make sure that they've got what they need, right? If they need help, we'd like to help them, like, get connected to the right resources. Um, and for the ones that are willing to talk about, like, hey, this was great and here's what I did for our project, you know, we'll amplify those stories as well. Um, I'll be talking and blogging about this kind of for the rest of the year. So. Okay, we can take one more question, and since Jenny is live tweeting, she totally gets to ask it. Awesome. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, so in all of your talk, you've been talking about projects, and they specifically seem, and I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, they seem like projects that are more likely to be things that we're using, so toolings and mm -hmm. languages and stuff like that. But as in this room, we've talked a lot about communities not just being about the projects we're actually using, but also the events that are going on. Right. How does events, which are a lot of the time grassroots people who no one knows about going, that, are, that need support to actually even just put a venue over their heads, mm -hmm. how do they get part of this funding? Or is that a plan to make that act more accessible? Um, really good question. Um, the way that I handled this when putting the budget together for this year was we have an allocation marked for conferences and events sponsorship that is separate from this pool. This pool is protected and only goes to project. Now, if a project wants to use the money to host events, great. Like, it's yours now, right? Um, but if there are um, events uh, or community needs that are bigger than an individual project that are around more of an ecosystem. Um, you know, we've got sponsorship dollars that we've set aside for that, some of which are earmarked for conferences and some of which are kind of things we expect to encounter over the year. Um, and so there's not a clear, we didn't build in a, a process for that in this part of it. Um, because I did, also, I didn't want to see us over-engineer an initial solution, right? As the year goes on, if we get a lot of requests for, hey, will you sponsor this event or this meetup or something that falls in the gray area, um, then we'll adjust the process as we go. Cool. Thank you. Somebody wants to come get the mic. In grateful reward for you moving in, we're about to start distributing chocolate by throwing it at y'all, so that's oh, going to be amazing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good to see nice you. Talk. Yeah, thank you. 
Come on in, the water's now fine. Now I can breathe. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Get this off. Get this on the mic. Yeah. 